Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a statement by Derek Mackay on the Scottish Government's draft spending and tax plans for 2018-2019. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Derek Mackay. Presiding officer, I am delighted to set out the Scottish Government's budget proposals for 2018-19. These comprehensive proposals will use the powers of this Parliament to build a fairer Scotland and put the progressive values of this Government into action. It invests in our public services and supports businesses to develop and thrive. Of course, this is a budget delivered in the most challenging of circumstances. We must support our economy to keep pace with the changing technology and access new markets whilst also dealing with UK government austerity and the damaging uncertainty caused by Brexit. Austerity and uncertainty is damaging the UK economy. With a knock-on effect on public finances, the pound has fallen, inflation has risen and growth forecasts have been downgraded. As a result, we face the most challenging economic and fiscal environment for any budget in the devolution era. Would Mr Finlay wait till the end of the statement for the point of order? No. Okay, Mr. Mr Finlay, if it's a genuine point of order, if I find this a political interruption, I will not be happy, Mr Finlay. Mr Finlay. Point of order. President officer, we usually receive statements when the Cabinet Secretary starts his statement. Apparently this time we're not getting it until he finishes. Is that okay. a change in procedure? I get the point, Mr Finlay, but that's not a point of order. Cabinet Secretary. As a result, we face the most challenging economic and fiscal environment for any budget in the devolution era. However, the fundamentals of the Scottish economy remain strong. Since 2007, Scotland has largely closed the productivity gap with the rest of the UK, and in 2017, our economy continued to grow. The number of people in work has reached a record high and unemployment is close to its lowest ever level. Today, the Scottish Fiscal Commission has published its first comprehensive report on Scotland's economic and fiscal forecast. And my thanks go to the Commission for their work. The SFC report underlines these fundamental strengths in our economy. It predicts continued growth, that employment will rise further, and that earnings growth will match the UK. But the Commission also highlight the negative impact Brexit will have and the challenges we will face from a declining working age population. They forecast that productivity growth will be subdued, that the labour market will tighten as a result of reduced migration and that this will impact on GDP. While the Commission's forecasts for growth are more cautious than other forecasters, it is clear that to grow faster, we must boost productivity and grow our working age population. And that's why this budget sets out immediate measures to stimulate economic activity and improve productivity. For Scotland's future prosperity, this parliament must also reach a consensus on the powers we need to increase the number of working age people in Scotland. And we must continue to make the case for a common sense solution to Brexit that keeps Scotland and the UK in the single market and the customs union. Even while we do this, however, we will redouble our efforts to ensure our economy will flourish, no matter the outcome of the negotiations. Presiding officer, equally important to the budget's economic context is the fiscal context. Over the 10 years to 2019-20, Tory austerity will see the Scottish Government's fiscal block grant allocation reduced in real terms by £2.6 billion. And despite the claims of the Chancellor, as the independent Fraser of Allender Institute recently stated, and I quote, by 2019-20, the resource block grant will be around £500 million lower than in 17-18. Of course, we welcome the additional capital funding that will transfer to Scotland, and we will make good use of the financial transactions that are available. But the reality is, 
You cannot spend financial transactions on teachers, nurses or police. <laughs> Instead, we will use Scotland's own resources to invest in our public services and provide the support and infrastructure our economy needs to flourish in a low carbon, high technology world. We believe strong public services and a vibrant economy go hand in hand. Undoubtedly, our public services require a strong economy to generate investment. But equally, the most successful economies in Europe are built upon the firm foundation of strong public services. The heart of this budget is immediate action to support the economy. A series of key investments and programmes that deliver for business now and build the right environment for the future. The global economy is changing at an unprecedented rate, but Scotland already has competitive advantages in many industries of the future, like life sciences and renewable energy. And this budget therefore delivers an increase of £278 million, a 64% increase in the economy, jobs and fair work portfolio. This additional funding contributes to investment of almost £2.4 billion in enterprise and skills through our enterprise agencies and our skills bodies. The increased investment includes a 70% uplift in our funding for business research and investment, taking our investment in the coming year from £22 million to £37 million. The budget also contains an initial £10 million to support the new South of Scotland Enterprise Agency and it doubles to £122 million the funding allocated to the city-region deals. Through the Scottish Funding Council, the budget also invests around £1.8 billion in our colleges and universities, providing a real terms increase in their funding. This investment funds the teaching, research and innovation that will provide opportunities for our young people, train the workforce of the future and drive up our productivity. And the budget allocates an initial £18 million for the new National Manufacturing Institute announced by the First Minister on Monday. And construction of this new centre of excellence begins next year. And Scotland has a world leading reputation for our efforts to tackle climate change to support our transition to the low carbon economy. And the budget allocates 60 million pounds for a low carbon innovation fund. And we'll also invest 1.2 billion pounds in our transport infrastructure, including support for new and improved road and rail developments, not only dueling the A9, but turning it into an electric highway and delivering new railway investments like the electric trains now running between Edinburgh and Glasgow. In addition, we'll make a £20 million investment in the coming year to support the transition to electric vehicles and support more green buses. And as promised in the programme for government, the budget doubles investment in active and sustainable travel. In total, this budget invests over £4 billion in infrastructure, part of our £20 billion infrastructure investment plan over this Parliament. Presiding officer, I can confirm today that the budget also includes the first steps towards one of the most significant infrastructure projects in this Parliament, super fast broadband for the whole of Scotland. At the end of this year, we will achieve our target of delivering fibre internet access to at least 95% of premises. As a result of our actions to date, Scotland has experienced the fastest rate of progress of any part of the UK. But we want that progress to continue. Our new Reaching 100 programme is an ambitious plan to make super fast broadband available to every home and to every business premise in every part of Scotland by 2021. This commitment will position Scotland at the forefront of the digital revolution 
and is unmatched anywhere in the UK. I am therefore... I am therefore delighted to confirm to Parliament that the initial procurement for the Reaching 100 programme begins today and that over the next, over the next four financial years it will be supported by investment of £600 million. Pounds. Investment in skills and innovation, new technologies, manufacturing, infrastructure and broadband. These are all part of a package of measures to improve our productivity, boost our trade and make Scotland the most attractive place to do business. We will support the internationalisation of our businesses and help boost exports through the work of Scottish Development International. And we'll also support our culture sector with a £10 million investment in a new screen unit and funding to protect arts and culture. Now let me turn to business rates. Following the Barclay review, I confirmed I would go beyond what is recommended with a set of new reliefs to incentivise investment. Our growth accelerator means no business rates increases will be payable for new or improved properties for a period of one year. And a separate additional measure will ensure that no new build property will enter the valuation role until it is first occupied. The budget also protects our small business bonus scheme, which lifts 100,000 properties out of business rates altogether. This scheme is part of the most competitive package of rates relief anywhere in the UK. And in the coming year, this package will be worth around £720 million, a record high. I can also now confirm that we will accept the remaining Barclay recommendations almost entirely, except on charity relief which we don't intend to curtail for universities or council alleys. An implementation plan providing fuller details on how and when these reforms will be implemented is being published today. The Barclay Review also favoured a switch from RPI to CPI for the application of the inflationary uplift to the poundage rate, but was unable to recommend this in the context of its revenue neutral remit. For many Scottish businesses though, this was the number one ask of the budget. I can therefore announce today that the inflationary uplift for the poundage next year will be capped at CPI, not RPI. Presiding officer, our package of business rates measures provides a boost of almost £100 million and helps keep Scotland the most attractive place in the UK to do business. And nowhere is the interaction between investment and public services in a successful economy seen more than in education. And raising the bar for all and closing the attainment gap is the key priority for this government. Since my last budget, over 2,300 schools have benefited from targeted investment and 506 extra teachers are teaching in Scotland schools because of our Attainment Scotland Fund. I'm therefore delighted to announce today that I am increasing the Attainment Scotland Fund to £179 million. This means £120 million will again be allocated direct to head teachers through the Pupil Equity Fund. And a further £59 million will be providing targeted support for children and young people in greatest need. I'm also allocating £10 million for support to children and young people with complex additional support needs. We recognise that a strong education system relies on a strong teaching profession and that's why I'm committing an overall funding package of £88 million in the local government finance settlement to maintain the national pupil-teacher ratio 
and ensure that places are provided for all probationer teachers. And this budget also protects our continued commitment to university education free of tuition fees. And presiding officer, this government is committed to getting it right for every child. We want Scotland to be the best place in the world to grow up. And since its introduction in August, over 20,000 baby boxes have been delivered. And this budget funds this important part of our social contract. A child's early years are critical in determining outcomes in later life. Since 2014, we have increased high quality early learning and childcare by almost 50% to 600 hours per year. By 2020, we'll increase publicly funded entitlement to 1,140 hours per year, benefiting thousands of children and parents across Scotland. And this requires us to invest now for the long term. In 2017-18, we provided £60 million to support the expansion. Now for 2018-19, we are allocating £93 million in resource funding and £150 million of capital funding. That's a total investment of £243 million next year. This will support the expansion by upskilling the early years workforce, refurbishing and expanding of existing premises and constructing new settings. And it will also provide funding for graduate level early learning and childcare courses. This means that in the coming year, we will invest almost a quarter of a billion pounds to build more nurseries, support childcare professionals, create jobs and graduate opportunities and provide support for parents. Ours is the best publicly funded childcare package in the UK and an investment that will pay dividends throughout the lives of our young people. Local authorities are our partners in delivering vital services, and I welcome the constructive engagement from COSLA. Throughout our discussions, I've made clear my desire to treat local government fairly, and I believe this budget does so. I know that local authorities have been concerned about a possible cut to their budgets of around 300 million pounds. However, as a result of the decisions that underpin this budget, I have been able to avoid this. I can announce today that the local government resource budget will be protected in cash terms and the capital budget will be increased in real terms, resulting in a total increase in local authority core funding of £94 million. <laughs> In addition, local authorities have the option to increase the council tax by up to 3%, and if they choose to do so, they will raise an additional £77 million, which would secure a real terms increase in local government funding. Local government will also be beneficiaries of the doubling of investment in city deals. Our police and fire services also make a huge contribution to our local communities. And we will deliver more than £20 million of additional investment to protect the police revenue budget and an additional £5.5 million for continued transformation of the fire service. Scotland's police and fire services will also retain the full benefit of at long last having the ability to recover VAT, boosting their spending power by £35 million in 2018-19. The budget also secures investment in key measures to make our communities safer, including tackling domestic abuse, reducing reoffending, protecting witnesses, and modernising the justice system. Ensuring that everyone in Scotland has access to good quality, secure, affordable housing is a key part of making Scotland fairer. New figures out this week show that since 2007, this government has delivered nearly 71,000 affordable homes and we're building social rented housing at twice the rate of the government in England. Our commitment to deliver 50,000 affordable homes over the five years of this parliament is a significant challenge, but one that we are determined to meet. The benefits of this investment will be felt throughout our society for generations to come. I'm therefore delighted to announce investment in 2018-19 of 756 million pounds 
part of our commitment to invest over £3 billion in affordable housing over this Parliament. <laughs> and we'll also take steps uh, to make home ownership a reality for more of our young people. To help achieve this, I'm introducing a new relief on land and building transaction tax for first-time buyers up to £175,000. <clears> All first-time buyers will benefit from this, and as a result, 80% of first-time buyers will, take out, will be taken out of LBTT altogether. Alongside this record investment in housing, we'll also invest £137 million in 2018-19 in energy efficiency and heat decarbonisation. Good quality affordable housing is one way in which we can help to drive down poverty. And one of the most devastating results of Tory austerity has been a rise in rough sleeping and homelessness. Our programme for government set out a national commitment to eradicate rough sleeping and transform the use of temporary accommodation. In 2018-19, we'll invest £10 million in an Ending Homelessness Together Fund that will invest £50 million over the next five years. <coughs> Excuse me. It, this will drive change and improvement in line with recommendations of the Homelessness and the Rough Sleeping uh, Action Group. We will also tackle child poverty in all its forms. This budget supports the first investment of a new £50 million tackling child poverty fund, which will help address the underlying social and economic cause of poverty. And we will also continue to mitigate UK welfare reform, investing over £100 million on interventions including the bedroom tax, reversal, uh, reversal of the bedroom tax and the Scottish Welfare Fund. This Parliament is currently passing our own Social Security Bill and while I cannot allocate funding for specific benefits until the Bill is completed, I can confirm I will allocate additional funding in year to support the landmark step of increasing carers' allowance. This increase will be delivered by summer 2018 and backdated to April. The staff in our schools, hospitals and other public services do an outstanding job. And we've always sought to offer a fair deal, particularly for the lowest paid by ensuring that all public sector workers earn the living wage and that those on low pay received guaranteed increases. However, now is the time to lift the 1% pay cap. We are determined to provide a pay package that is affordable and one that also reflects the increasing cost of living. And I'm grateful for the constructive engagement of the trade unions on this matter, including the joint letter from myself and the STUC to the Chancellor ahead of the autumn budget. Unfortunately, those calls were ignored by the Chancellor and this limits how far we can go on pay. However, unlike governments across the UK, we committed to lifting the pay cap and lift it we will. Today I've published a progressive pay policy and I can confirm that we will deliver a guaranteed minimum pay increase of 3% for all public sector workers earning £30,000 or less. For those earning above £30,000, we will limit the increase to 2% and apply a cash cap of £1,600 to those earning £80,000 or more. This demonstrates our commitment to closing the gap between the lowest and highest paid. Presiding officer, this is a framework that will apply to the public sector pay negotiations. However, let me make clear three additional points. Firstly, notwithstanding the policy I'm setting out today, we will respect the recommendations of independent pay review bodies. Secondly, we'll be mindful of any developments for NHS staff elsewhere in the UK to ensure that our health service staff are treated at least as fairly as those in any of the UK nations. And we will retain flexibility to enable us to address any particular recruitment challenges. Once again, the Scottish Government is leading by example, delivering on our promises and putting fairness at the heart of what we do. So our decision to lift the pay cap will benefit thousands of nurses and healthcare staff. And I know that I speak for everyone in the chamber when I thank our NHS staff for the work they do in caring for the people of Scotland. 
Our approach to health and care is one of reform and investment. And that is why in the coming year, we will invest £110 million in the reform of primary care, supporting our GPs and health centres to meet the changing needs of our people. And we'll increase our direct investment in mental health and child and adolescent mental health in particular by a further £17 million. And a third annual increase in a row, which will help to deliver an additional 800 mental health workers over this parliament. This budget will also deliver over £550 million in 2018-19 in direct support of social care and integration through the Scottish Government and NHS investment. We will continue to support free personal care and the rollout of Frank's Law by April 2019. Underpinning all of this is increasing investment in the NHS. This year, to increase health resource spending in line with inflation would require an additional £200 million. That is equal to the amount being cut from Scotland Resource Block Grant in real terms this year by the UK Government. But we've been clear that over this Parliament, we will increase health resource spending by a total of £2 billion, considerably more than inflation. So today, I can confirm that our increase in health resource funding in 2018-19 will not be £200 million, it will be more than £400 million, taking our total frontline investment to over £13 billion in the coming year. Presiding officer, on this budget, we're investing in the NHS, increasing social care investment, protecting local services, delivering a growth package for business and supporting the low carbon transition, providing real terms increases for our universities and colleges, expanding childcare, directing more resources to head teachers to close the attainment gap, protecting our police and fire services, safeguarding culture and the arts, taking action to alleviate poverty, lifting the public sector pay cap. However, in the face of real terms cuts to our block grant, it has been possible to deliver for the NHS and support these other investments only because of the decisions I have taken on tax. We do not take tax decisions lightly. In November, we'll set out, we have set out four key tests that any change to income tax would have to meet. It must protect low earners, make tax fairer, generate additional revenues for public services and protect our economy. We also commissioned advice informed by the Council of Economic Advisers on options for additional rate of tax. Having carefully considered contributions from the public, civic society and business community, I've decided to reform Scotland's income tax system. Using the limited powers available to us, the decisions I have reached will make our income tax system fairer. They will safeguard those on low incomes and overall, when coupled with our spending decisions, will protect and grow the economy. And it will provide essential revenue to enable us to invest in our NHS without imposing cuts on vital services such as social care, business support, police or education. Our proposals have been modelled by the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the revenue forecasts underpin this budget. Where forecasts suggest that a particular tax change would result in a significant behavioural impact, I don't have the luxury of simply ignoring it. As a result, I've set income tax policy at levels which the analysis says will generate additional revenue. The changes I am proposing are as follows. Firstly, I will increase the higher and top rates of tax by one percentage point to 41p and 46p respectively. This sets the top rate of tax at a level which will generate the most income with the least risk of losing revenues next year and damaging the economy. Had we gone further, our modelling indicates that once behavioural effects and forestalling are considered, a higher rate could actually reduce income tax revenue next year. And that's not a decision any sensible government would take. Secondly, I will freeze the basic rate at 20p. But to make the system more progressive, I will introduce a new intermediate rate of 21p. The intermediate rate will apply to income between 24,000 and the higher rate threshold of 44,273 pounds, which will increase in line with inflation only. To make Scotland's income tax system even fairer and more progressive, 
I've chosen to make one further change. I can announce today that I'll introduce a new Scottish starter rate of income tax of 19p. This new rate will apply to the first £2,000 of taxable income between £11,850 and £13,850. This new starter rate, combined with the increase in the personal allowance, will ensure that no one earning less than £33,000, which is 70% of all taxpayers, will pay any more in tax than they do now for given incomes. On the contrary, anyone earning below £33,000 will sl pay slightly less in tax in the coming year than they do this year. The introduction of the new starter rate will also mean that those earning up to £26,000, which is 55% of all taxpayers in Scotland, will pay marginally less tax than they would if they lived elsewhere in the UK. So the specific tax reforms I've announced today will raise an additional £164 million for investment in our public services and our economy. However, taken together with our tax decisions last year, the projected growth of our tax revenues relative to the UK as a whole and relative economic growth or income tax receipts in 2018-19 are forecast to generate £366 million more than the corresponding block grant adjustment under the fiscal framework. These decisions have therefore enabled me to reverse the real terms cut that Westminster has imposed on our resource budget next year, whilst ensuring that Scotland is not just the fairest tax part of the UK, but for the majority of taxpayers, the lowest tax part of the UK. Presiding officer, in all of these decisions in the interests of our economy have been at the forefront of my mind. I have already outlined a range of economic investments and I want to briefly mention two more. One of the touchstone pledges from our programme for government was the creation of the Scottish National Investment Bank to provide long-term patient capital to support innovation and drive productivity growth. And today we signal our ambition for the bank with a commitment to an initial £340 million capitalisation between 2019 and 21. However, while the bank is being established, I intend to create a dedicated Building Scotland Fund. This fund will be worth £150 million over the next two financial years, and its purpose will be to support innovation in house building, help deliver modern low-carbon industrial and commercial facilities, and provide further support for business-led research and development. And we will set out further details shortly. <coughs> Presiding officer, this new fund, together with an additional of £96 million investment in maintaining the most attractive system of business rates in the UK, a 70% increase in funding for business R&D, £60 million of investment in delivering low-carbon technology, over £4 billion of investment in new infrastructure, doubling investment in city deals, a £600 million package to deliver 100% super-fast broadband to all, and almost £2.4 billion of funding for enterprise and skills, demonstrates beyond doubt that this budget backs Scotland's businesses and will help to grow Scotland's economy. So, presiding officer, this is a budget, it's a comprehensive package of measures designed to protect all that we hold dear. It provides the investments we need to meet the challenges of today and seize the opportunities of tomorrow. It uses the power of this parliament sensibly and in the interest of the country as a whole. It overturns the Tory cuts to our block grant. It delivers an additional £400 million to the health service without damaging other vital services. It protects the vast majority of taxpayers. It is a budget for fairness and a budget for growth. It is a budget for all of Scotland 
and I commend it to the Chamber. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions for just under the next uh, 60 minutes. So if you wish to ask a question, please press your request to speak button now. And I call on Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement, heavily redacted uh, as it was. It looks just like the SNP's plans to grow the Scottish economy, presiding officer. No. There is one thing. There is one thing, presiding officer. Order, please. One thing, presiding officer, absolutely clear from the Scottish Government's budget today. You cannot trust a word this First Minister or this Scottish Government say. In the SNP manifesto last year, the wording was perfectly clear. They promised to freeze the basic rate and income tax throughout the Parliament to protect those on low and middle incomes. Unless there be any doubt as to what this meant, it was helpfully clarified by the First Minister in this chamber as recently as May this year when she said this, when inflation is rising and living standards are under a lot of pressure, it is not right to increase income tax for those who are on the basic rate. Today, presiding officer, the SNP and every member of this government has broken their promise to the Scottish people. Despite pledging not to increase taxes for those on the basic rate, a pledge repeated 53 times, and despite 65% of the Scottish population in May last year voting to endorse that position, today they are proposing to do the opposite and increase taxes for those on the basic rate. No one will believe a word they say ever again, <laughs> presiding officer. So can the Finance Secretary tell me exactly how many people currently paying tax at the basic rate will see an increase in the tax they pay as a result of this new NAT tax announced today? <laughs> and let me be clear, Presiding Officer, there is absolutely no justification for the tax rises being proposed. According to Spice, the Scottish Government's block grant from Westminster is going up in real terms from this year to the next. And in the analysis published on Tuesday from the Fraser of Allender Institute, they say, and I quote, the Scottish Government's total block grant, resource and capital, but excluding financial transactions, is on track to increase by around 1% between 2016-17 and 2019-20. If the Finance Secretary had done his homework properly before he came to the Chamber this afternoon, he would know that financial transactions are not included in that figure, presiding officer. So there we have it. There we have it. Not hundreds of millions of cuts, no Westminster austerity, but a budget increasing in real terms over the next three years. So the tax rises announced today for basic rate payers are the result of policy choices made by the SNP and no one else. And when we see the Scottish Fiscal Commission projections for economic growth, we will know exactly where the problem lies. Because what they will show is that the Scottish economy is projected to grow at a fraction of the rate of the UK economy as a whole. And it is this failure to grow the Scottish economy and the failure to expand the tax base that leads the SNP to put their hands into the pockets of hard-working Scottish families and businesses to try and bail them out of the mess they are making of the Scottish public finances. Okay. And not only, presiding officer, will we see taxes rise, but once again, we are seeing cuts to local government. The frontline services that millions of families depend upon, not least in our schools, will we slash back at the same time as taxes are going up. Under the SNP, we all pay more, but we are getting less in return. Yeah. So, presiding officer, the message of this budget is simply this. Don't be ambitious. Don't be hardworking. Don't be successful in the SNP Scotland, because we will penalise you for our failure to grow the Scottish economy. So will the Finance Secretary now take this opportunity to apologise on behalf of his government yep. for breaking their promise in their manifesto? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I would have thought, given First Minister's question, that Murdo Fraser had two hours to, to change his script and failed to do so. <laughs> uh, 
first of all, the biggest threat to Scotland's economy, UK's economy, as it happens, is the Tory party with their economic yeah. mismanagement and mishandling. But if you want to talk about the, the philosophy and the economics of the Tories, it remains the case that, again, they want to raise less and spend more. It's just not possible. We have provided a balanced budget. Myrtle Fraser has asked, will I apologise? I'm very proud of this budget because it invests on in the things that we hold dear. And I think it speaks to the kind of Scotland that we want to build. So I'm very proud eh, of this eh, budget. Myrtle Fraser has spoken about basic rate taxpayers. The basic rate, check the document, the basic rate has been frozen. But as a matter of fact, of basic rate taxpayers, 80% will pay less next year, not more, less, Mr Fraser. And 55% of taxpayers earning up to £26,000 will pay less than elsewhere in the UK. So for a majority of taxpayers, this is the lowest tax part of the UK. But you know what's even more important than that? It's in using our tax system in a progressive fashion makes us the fairest part of the United yeah. Kingdom. And that's something to be proud of. Now, we've all quoted the Fraser of Allen Institute, and I'll happily do that as well, because Myrtle Fraser has mentioned capital spending, and particularly financial transactions. FAI said Scottish ministers are constrained in how these financial transactions can be used. So it does remain the case that resource spending next year and for the next two years is going down, just as it has done over the last period, amounting to a £2.6 billion reduction to Scotland's resource budget. But I have been doing a I have been doing my, my homework, uh, Mr Fraser. I've got, a, I've got another figure for you. If I was... Uh, careful now. I uh, have checked out... If I followed Tory tax policies, uh, I have established what it would take from Scotland's uh, frontline public uh, services. So I costed what they told me to do on income tax, on LBTT, on council tax reform, on large business supplement. What I've now discovered that to follow Tory tax policies would reduce, in addition to the block grant reduction, would reduce, would reduce the resources available to frontline services by a further £501 million. Pounds. Raise less, spend more, it can be done. So in the next... Fantasy land. In the next hour, if I hear any Conservative ask for more money for anything, I will point to that half a billion pound reduction if I followed their tax policies. I will not follow their tax policies. I will follow our policies which deliver fairness and social justice and a stronger economy. Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, this parliament was designed to be a power for change, to take Scotland to a better place and to bring decision making closer to the people. So while the Tories force austerity on the UK, we in Scotland should be using the powers of our parliament to deliver an alternative. No, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. Because the truth is, Scotland needs real and radical change, not tinkering around the edges. And it should be based on the principle. And it should be based on the principle of from each according to their means, to each according to their need. A penny on the top rate just does not do it. This, this Tory light draft budget fails on all of those tests. As the Cabinet Secretary, as the Cabinet Secretary would know had he taken the time to speak with the councillors, the council workers and the trade unionists who lobbied this parliament today in communities and workplaces across Scotland, there is a growing mood of frustration and discontent which is increasingly directed towards an SNP government 
that has simply presided over Tory austerity and has added to it. We know, we know that tens of thousands of local government jobs have been lost, that there are 3,500 fewer teachers, £1.5 billion already stripped from our councils since 2011. So how many local jobs will be cut this year by this budget? And when the Cabinet Secretary, and when the Cabinet Secretary says he knows, he knows that councils were worried about a potential £300 million cut, that's true. But what he is doing today is cutting day-to-day -day spending in real terms by £134 million. When, when councils have already told him that they need £545 million just to stand still, that is an effective cut of almost £700 million to our lifeline local services. So why won't? So why won't the Cabinet Secretary stand up for properly funded local services? Why won't he stand up for properly funded lifeline services? Why won't he stand up for the people and communities of Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Um, ju ju just a, a gentle point to Richard Leonard. The microphone amplifies um, what you're saying to the <laughs> chamber. I, 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 I have to say, to begin with, during the course of yesterday's debate, I was told that James Kelly was the finance spokesperson. I know the term of office for a Labour leader is pretty short these days, but one day for the finance spokesperson. <laughs> that's, that's setting a new, a new timescale for Labour spokespeople. But look, seriously, 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 I heard Richard Leonard at First Minister's Questions talk about housing, I listened very closely to what he was saying. I thought it was very important what was being said uh, around housing. And, and that's specifically why we're putting more funds in to support house building uh, in Scotland. As to the specific questions, why don't we use the powers of the Scottish Parliament? We are using the powers <laughs> of the Scottish Parliament. We're using them to the full to protect the people of Scotland from Tory cuts. And if only... If only the Labour Party had helped give us more powers, we would have been able to do even more to protect the people of Scotland in the face of Tory austerity and Brexit mismanagement. And in terms, in ter I mean, they're still shouting about the powers thing. The Tories say, don't use the powers that we do have. And in terms of Richard Leonard, he wants us to use powers we don't have. <laughs> what we're putting forward is a credible budget with real investment in our social priorities, setting out the kind of country that we want to build and using our tax system in a way that's progressive and fairer. Now, I've set out priorities in education, economy, environment and health. But, you know, if I stick to what the Labour Party are proposing today and give it all to local government, a view that you're entitled to have. What have the NHS done to upset the Labour Party? That means no new resources for the NHS or anyone else. So when the Labour members get up in the next 48 minutes, let's see if they ask for resources elsewhere when their proposition is only give it to local government. And in relation to local government, in relation to local government, they were projecting a 3% reduction. That's about £300 million reduction to their budget. That's not what I'm proposing. I'm proposing flat cash plus a capital increase. And what that means, we are using our powers. If councils use their powers, they will have a real terms increase for front line services. And Richard Leonard is still shaking his head. I'll make one final point to Richard Leonard. He explained very recently why Labour authorities, the eight Labour authorities, didn't increase the council tax. He said that because the Scottish Government didn't give councils enough money, Labour councils would raise even less. What a ridiculous proposition from the Labour Party. So we have supported local government and a range of other priorities, and we will be very proud 
of the job creation, the services it supports, of the interventions that it will deliver to create a fairer society. Patrick Harvey. Fighting officer, for nearly two years now, the Scottish Greens have been leading the argument for reform of our income tax now that we have the power to do it. By adding new rates and bans, we showed that we can raise additional revenue for our public services while reducing tax at the bottom end of the income scale, not at the top end as the Conservatives at the UK Government seem to continue to want. I'm delighted now that that basic argument for a more progressive tax structure appears to have won the day. And we're going to be seeing changes, not as soon as I would have wished them, we should have been here last year, and not as far as I would wish them either. But that basic argument for a more progressive income tax has won the day. We've also made the case for an uplift in public sector pay. Given the rising level of inflation, it is unacceptable to see those who've continued to see reductions in their real terms pay be given even more cuts. I recognise that the UK government budget doesn't make that easy, and the Scottish government is now proposing a CPI inflation uplift for those under £30,000, but not an inflation uplift for everybody else. I will wait to hear the response of the unions who represent those workers before taking a final view, but certainly those who are at the bottom end of the income scale absolutely deserve the pay increase that we've argued for and that the Scottish Government today is applying, at least to its own workers. Because the downside of what we've heard today is that the cost of that pay increase in local government is not being met by the Scottish Government grant to local councils. The Scottish Government is right to use its powers to increase the total revenue budget in real terms for the Scottish budget, but then to pass on a real terms cut to our local councils is not acceptable. And if we include the additional costs that our councils will face if they're going to apply the same kind of 3% uplift to public sector workers who are delivering vital services that every single one of us depend on, it is clear that the Scottish Government is going to have to make changes to its local government settlement. Can the Finance Minister tell us, if he doesn't do that, if he doesn't change what he's proposed today for local government, is there any consequence other than real terms pay cuts, service cuts or job losses in our councils? Cabinet Secretary. I, I, should, uh, I should remind uh, the Chamber on what I've said around uh, local government, that the settlement that I'm proposing uh, is far better than they were forecasting or uh, expecting. Specifically, specifically on the point around using powers, I've said again that if councils use their council tax powers uh, up to a level of 3% increase, that would put local authorities into real terms uh, growth. Patrick Harvey also covered the tax structure point. Uh, he's right to say that this uh, government, being a minority government, had to engage and consult and listen, and I've certainly been doing that, and I think that's been evidenced in our proposition, but also want to give uh, stability to the country as well. And we all have to compromise in a parliament of minorities, uh, but I've certainly embarked uh, in an open uh, and inclusive style to ensure that we can uh, come to some sort of consensus on tax, and that should uh, continue. We set out four key tests on what we would do with income tax. Uh, to raise revenues for public services, uh, to use a tax system in a way that protects lower income uh, earners, to have a system that delivers progressivity, uh, and also to support our economy. And of course, that relates to how we choose to spend those uh, resources uh, as well. Uh, I specifically mentioned the top rate of tax uh, earlier on. Uh, Richard Leonard also touched upon it, as has uh, Patrick Harvey previously. We've decided to put the top rate of tax at the level that raises the most amount of money. Sure, that's a sensible and progressive thing to do so that those resources can be invested uh, without deterring uh, investment uh, to uh, Scotland. Uh, on pay, we don't set the pay policy for local government, but we have set out, I think, a very fair a public sector pay policy for those under our uh, control, which is using the pay policy in a progressive fashion, just as we've done uh, with the uh, tax policy. And there are sufficient resources within the settlements proposed uh, to support uh, a, fa a fair uh, pay settlement. And the final point 
I would reinforce as one that Patrick Harvey uh, actually uh, made himself, which is that the Chancellor didn't give us anything extra for pay and said very little in the UK context. There's the independent peer review specifically for uh, health, and of course we will look at that uh, very closely and have set our position in that uh, regard. But with no new resources, in fact, a real terms reduction in the resources that fund pay, we've had to make necessary decisions to support our public services and properly remunerate uh, our public sector workers. And I've tried to do it in uh, the fairest way possible. Willie Rennie. Thank you, President Officer. Um, we will scrutinise the tax announcement today. The devil is often in the detail. But it seems that this is a modest increase in taxation, an approach that we argued for at the election and an approach that he opposed at the election. This budget does not do enough to meet the long-term needs of the economy. It does not include the transformational investment in education that we argued for. And it's certainly we are far behind England on the attainment funds, many years behind. And this small increase announced today will not close that gap. Colleges, they've only got half of the money that they asked for just to stand still. That's not going to reverse the 150,000 cuts to college places over the last few years or train the mature students or women that desperately need extra support. And if he thinks a paltry £17 million will solve the problems in our mental health services, then he needs to think again. But the settlement for local government is harsh, passing the buck for cuts to councils. The pay increase is welcome, but can the Finance Secretary explain who is paying for the pay increase? Are councils and colleges being given extra funds to pay for this increase? I think this budget pays lip service to many of the challenges that this country faces. Does he not just accept that? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, again, just on a wee point of accuracy, I'm pretty sure what Willie Rennie said previously would have ring-fenced all extra resources just for education. Again, just like the Labour Party, you're entitled to take that position. But that does also mean no new money for anything else, including the National Health Service. And for that matter, mental health within the National Health Service. So I'm afraid when it comes to actually delivering a budget, the detail is really uh, important on such matters. Uh, colleges have had a very fair and reasonable settlement. It's a real terms increase for higher and further education. And of course, we have come to a settlement around uh, pay award for college lecturers as well. So yes, they're adequately resourced and local government has a fair settlement as well. But you can't escape the fact that you only wanted to ring fence all resources for one particular part of the public sector, which means you can't demand more in every other area. A, a basic principle in how you apply um, your, your policies uh, to this in future budgets. Thank you very much. Now, I've allowed a lot of latitude to front benches to make their party's position clear and to ask a question at length. There are just over 30 minutes and there are just under 30 people who wish to ask questions. So I think you can all work it out for yourselves. Short questions, short answers. Kate Forbes to be followed by Dean Lockhart. Presiding officer, and I am the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary. Fast internet connectivity is vital to the economic and social well-being of our rural community. So I welcome today's announcement of an incredible £600 million over the next four years to expand yeah. Yeah. fast broadband. As this is a reserved matter, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary whether the UK Government has made a financial contribution? Cabinet Secretary. Well, well actually, uh, to be fair, they have. I mean, and so they should, because they're a reserved matter and they should have been getting on with this. But we are surpassing what uh, the UK Government is uh, uh, delivering in terms of quality and speed and reach, covering every part of the country. Uh, their contribution to the £600 million? £21 million. Oh. Oh. Dean Lockhart to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Oh. Oh, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. When you're ready. Um, the Scottish Fiscal Commission forecasts have just been released for the next five years. They show that Scotland's economy will grow at less than 1% for the next five years and will continue to underperform the rest of the UK for the next five years. That's 14 years of SNP underperformance. Yeah. Given this dire outlook, why has the Finance Secretary completely ignored the advice of large and small businesses throughout Scotland that any increase in tax 
any increase in tax will cause long-term damage to the Scottish economy. Cabinet Secretary. Oh. The same business organisations also didn't say cut tax by half a billion pounds, which is what the Tories proposed with your yeah. um, tax policies. Yeah. Uh, the number one ask of many businesses actually was to uh, make the poundage for business rates CPI, not RPI, and have announced that the business rates poundage will be CPI, not RPI. And you know, in a range of investments, uh, whether it's on higher education, innovation hubs, internationalising our produce or supporting businesses to grow or the most generous package of business rates uh, relief in any part of the United Kingdom and investing in all these public services. This is a good budget for business uh, as well and specifically in relation to the forecast. Doesn't the UK government take any responsibility for the economy or any responsibility for the economy in Scotland? The UK economic model doesn't work for Scotland. We know that to be the case. And what the SFC have said in their analysis, now published today, and their forecast, is that the greatest threat to Scotland's economy is Brexit, is downward migration, is inflation. All those pressures that have been created by the economic geniuses in the Tory party. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by James Kelly. Officer, I welcome the Finance Secretary's statement. Can I remind the Chamber how many people in Scotland will enjoy a reduction in their income tax from April? And can I confirm that many thousands more could have shared in this had the UK Tory government not cut £500 million from Scotland's resource budget over the next two years and the Tories simultaneously want to cut tax and increase spending? Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us how much less we would have to spend for services like the NHS under their plans to cut taxes? only for the better off in society. Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> the, uh, I mean, to be fair, I don't think even the Tories understand their tax and economic policies at the moment. And it seems to have come as a surprise that I've costed what their tax policies would mean for public services. And to be precise, that's £501 million reduction, frontline public services. But just to remind the Chamber on income tax, more than 70% of taxpayers will pay less tax next year. Uh, those earning under £33,000 will pay less tax for 55% of taxpayers in Scotland, earning up to £26,000. They will pay less tax than elsewhere in the United Kingdom. So that's a good proposition. It also represents the best deal for what you pay and what you get, the best deal anywhere in the United yeah, Kingdom. Yeah, Thank you. James Kelly to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Much as Derek Mackay likes to spin it, this budget represents at least £134 million cut to local councils. Yeah. So why is it that top-rate taxpayers earning more than £150,000 are only asked to be pay, to pay an additional 1p on their rate, while local people in local communities face the prospect of job losses and losses to vital public services? Cabinet Secretary. Um, <clears throat> I can see why James Kelly was reshuffled after 24 hours in the post as finance spokesperson. Um, you know, Kezia, Kezia Dugdale might be back from the jungle, but James Kelly's auditioning for Pointless, I understand. <laughs> um, in terms of... In terms of... Uh, See what I mean, presiding officer? Uh, what I was pointing out in the proposition I was, I was setting out earlier is income tax will be made more progressive. That's in a very important shift. The more money uh, you earn, essentially the more money you pay towards public services uh, in Scotland. And why? Why didn't I go further on the top rate of tax? Because all the advice I have been given uh, by the Scottish Fiscal Commission, the Council of Economic Advisers, and others that essentially that was the optimal point at which to raise the most amount of money. Surely that's the objective of the exercise to raise more money to invest in our public services in a fair and progressive way. The Labour Party are saying set it higher for whatever reason which will raise less money. And Mr Kelly, that means less money going to things like local government. I'm trying to raise 
more money in a fair and progressive way. Do we get it yet? Are we there yet? But I will, to be helpful, I will share the workings of the SFC and the Council of Economic Advisers to set out how the rate I have set is absolutely meeting the commitment of raising the optimum amount of money for Scotland's public services. John Mason to be followed by Maurice Golden. Thank you. Uh, the Barclay Review recommended the removal of rates relief for independent schools. Can the Cabinet Secretary clarify the position on this? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, that's right. That was a, a recommendation of the Barclay uh, Review. And I'm accepting it in part. I want to be clear about this. All the details are, are in the uh, implementation plan that's uh, published uh, today. I want to make an important distinction and that's around special schools. I think their support should be continued and also those schools with exceptional circumstances. So full details are uh, in the chamber. But again, as I said I would, I would respond having engaged with the sector, uh, listen and look uh, at all the evidence to ensure that we make the right balanced decision. Uh, but essentially, uh, independent schools, other than those I've mentioned, should be treated the same as council schools. Mm -hmm. Maurice Golden to be followed by Alec Neil. How much extra tax will a primary school teacher earning £35,000 per year pay as a result of the NAT tax? Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> That's just... It's just... It's just, it's just pathetic. I mean, of course, it, it depends. Well, it, it depends on how much that teacher happens uh, to earn. But of course, teachers like, teachers like others will welcome the public sector pay policy as well. I'll say again, because everyone will be interested in this. Those earning under £33,000 will pay less tax. That's Alec Neil to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I first of all congratulate the Finance Secretary for the additional measures he's taken in relation to child poverty and say I fully understand that he can't do anything in benefits until the Social Security Bill is enacted and the appropriate administrative arrangements are put in place. Uh, however, in the meantime, between now and the finalisation of the budget, if he is able to identify any additional spare cash, can he give priority to giving more money into projects like the Tackling Child Poverty Fund, because with the increase in child poverty and the scale of child poverty we have in Scotland, it is clearly an urgent measure that I know he agrees requires further action by the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary. Now, I think that uh, Alec Neil raises a very uh, fair point in looking at the the impacts uh, of the uh, budget spend in terms of how it impacts on people and the most vulnerable in our society. And I know that Alec Neil will agree that many of the measures in here uh, support the most vulnerable and also protect people from the welfare reform, so-called, from the Conservatives. Things like reversing the bedroom tax and the Scottish Welfare Fund and our new measures to give children and young people the best start in life. And yesterday, the big idea from the Tories was to not go ahead with the baby box. I mean, I don't know what it is that the Tories have against giving children the best start in life, but I will consider very closely, very closely what Alec Neil has said around uh, tackling child poverty and look at what other measures uh, we may be able to consider. And that's why I'll also appreciate the work of the Child Poverty Commission as they work with us to address this very significant issue. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Ivan McKee. I welcome the recognition that economic growth matters. It does, after all, affect our future budget allocation under the terms of the fiscal framework. But growth has been downgraded by the OBR, downgraded by the Fraser of Allender Institute, and now downgraded by the Scottish Fiscal Commission. They are predicting weak growth of less than 1% over the next five years. We haven't seen such downward trends in decades. Given that the Scottish economy underperforms the rest of the UK and the forecasts from the Fiscal Commission suggest a much lower growth in Scotland, half that of the UK, has the Cabinet Secretary quantified the impact on the Scottish budget if we don't match growth in the rest of the UK? Cabinet Secretary. I don't think that um, Jackie Bailey was, was, was 
properly representing the SFC report, it didn't, it, it didn't, it, what it suggested, of course, it was the impact of Brexit uncertainty, uh, and uh, essentially that was, that was what was subduing uh, the growth uh, forecast uh, that uh, we, of course, have to rely on. I don't have the luxury of, of ignoring um, their uh, forecast, but actually what they said in terms of our, actually what they said, if Jackie Bailey wants to hear this, uh, in terms of what our budget has, uh, will be favourable because of the decisions that this government has taken. It is actually the good governance and the tax decisions that this government has taken that has actually ensured that we will have more resources to spend on Scotland's public services and will continue to have more resources with, I think, the, the commercial and the business and the enterprise interventions that we will make. You see, Jackie Bailey has missed every positive industrial and economic intervention and tax intervention announced in this, uh, this budget. And that's why Jackie Bailey doesn't understand that we will actually grow the Scottish economy with the interventions uh, that we will uh, make. Now, either Jackie Bailey knows that uh, to be the case, just doesn't want to admit it, or it's Jackie Bailey that doesn't understand the SFC report. report. I've had the luxury course of being briefed uh, by the SFC and I'm absolutely convinced that the policies we, we are setting out today will deliver economic growth. Ivan McKee to be followed by Adam Tompkins. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary outline how the Scottish Government will capitalise on the Scottish National Investment Bank to drive economic growth in the Scottish economy? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I've said that we will set aside resources to put into the Scottish National Investment Bank. I'm sure that will be warmly welcomed as part of our massive uh, infrastructure programme that will support both uh, housing and the infrastructure of our country and I think will be very warmly received by the business community. Adam Tompkins to be followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This NAT tax budget effectively splits the basic rate of income tax into three. How much will this additional bureaucracy cost to administer, who's paying for it, and what are its implications for pensions relief? Cabinet Secretary. Do you know, I, I, I thought that Adam Tompkins was pro-devolution. Now he's saying don't use our powers because it might cost oh, some money. Oh, I'll tell you something. I'll tell, I tell you something. When we, have, when we have delivered devolved taxes and used our powers, I'll tell you something. Revenue Scotland has done it in a far more efficient fashion than HMRC or any UK government agency. And of course we engage with HMRC and we give them sight of our tax policy and then they in turn absolutely cost uh, what it will uh, be for us to deliver policies. But it is a fraction of what we will actually raise for Scotland's public services. And that is why uh, an early decision on such matters is so important in giving stability to the people of Scotland. Yeah. Claire Adamson to be followed by Ian Gray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, the provision to local government to vary council tax by up to 3% will bring vital funding going forward. Would the Cabinet Secretary be prepared to explain to my constituents what the long-term consequences of the Labour administration put into power by Tory councillors in North Lanarkshire will be to them continuing to fail to maximise their revenue going forward. Cabinet Secretary. Hey, as, as, as I have said, if, if local authorities choose to use their council tax powers, uh, if they use them up to 3% in every council, that will raise £77 million for local government services. Ian Gray to be followed by Ben McPherson. The independent review into student support reported last month, uh, among other things, it recommended parity of support for FE and HE students. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain how £5 million allocated in his budget will provide parity for FE students, or are they to be betrayed just like university students who are promised their debt would be paid off? Cabinet Secretary. We, 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 uh, we have we've increased resources in real terms for higher education and further education. We're considering that, that report in full. We've already taken steps to support people and we'll give it further consideration. Ben McPherson to be followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Cabinet Secretary how his innovative and progressive budget proposals will benefit Edinburgh. Considering the capital's, considering the capital's needs, opportunities and population growth. Cabinet Secretary. 
I, I must apologise to Ben McPherson. I couldn't hear it because the Tories were shouting at Ben McPherson at the time. So it must be, it must be good. Uh, we, we, will make, we will make Scotland an attractive place to live, work and invest in. And I think it's the best package for support for business and people and society compared to anywhere else in the United Kingdom. A range of interventions for the economy, for education and environment to make sure that Scotland is a very attractive place. And I'm sure someone like Ben McPherson will sell Scotland positively other than the Tories who wanted to shout him down because all they know is that they want to talk Scotland down. You're the total opposite. The Tories are the total opposite of an economic development agency. They're the drag on Scotland's economy. Miles Briggs to be followed by Graham Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And meanwhile, back in the real world, Scotland is facing a recruitment crisis in our NHS, including a lack of nurses, GPs, radiologists, and consultants. Order, please. Order. Let's hear the question, and our please. Scottish medical schools are attracting and accepting just 50% of Scottish domiciled students. So, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary today, hiking taxes for these vital NHS staff, what message does that send out for people deciding to come? and work in our NHS in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, you see, when I was looking at the Tory um, request for more spending, one of the main culprits is Miles Briggs, which, yeah. which doesn't surprise you, because there's this question, more, more spending on yeah. health. Actually, it's this government, by our decisions on tax, that will be able to spend more yeah. record sums yeah. on the NHS. But just one difference. Just one difference between us and the UK government. We support our nurseries with bursaries as well, something that the Tories yeah. don't adequately don't do, either. as one example. Absolutely. So the Tories, yet again, want to raise less and spend more. Yeah. Only the SNP can be trusted to invest in our National Health Service. Yeah. Graham Dee to be followed by Anna Sara. Uh, thank you. The uh, programme for government was lauded as the greenest ever. Can the Cabinet Secretary encapsulate for the Chamber just how this budget facilitates the transition to a low carbon economy? Cabinet there, Secretary. There, there are a, a range of interventions around the transition to a low carbon economy, around transport, around housing, around innovation and digital um, as well, <coughs> energy efficiency also. So I think there's a range of measures uh, that will show that this is true to the word of the programme for government, which was described by many environmental campaigners as the greenest programme uh, of any government uh, in Scotland in terms of devolution. So I say that this uh, budget puts our money where our mouth is. Mm -hmm. And I start to be followed by Richard Lockett. Thank you, Presiding Officer. After seven years of pay restraint imposed by this government that is meant a real terms pay cut for nurses and teachers, a commitment to finally break the pay cap is welcome. But we still do not have a firm commitment of a real terms pay increase for public sector staff. It, following on from both Patrick Harvey and Willie Rennie's question, which the Finance Secretary failed to answer, can the Finance Secretary confirm whether he will provide specific and additional Scottish Government money to fully fund this pay increase, or whether health boards, local authorities and others will have to find this money from their existing budgets meaning further cuts to services or job losses. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I need to say to Anna Sarwar that in all of the budget settlements that I'm proposing and those that um, Anna has mentioned, we are increasing those budgets. Take just NHS, an over £400 million increase in the NHS. And of course, incidentally, if the UK government does act positively in the independent peer review for the NHS, and if that does result in a more uh, generous proposition than the one I'm putting forward, we've said we will at least match that. So the resources that we have put into portfolio budgets has created uh, the capacity to fund the pay award that I've announced uh, in a public sector pay policy this afternoon. I just make one final point, that whatever the Labour Party say in this chamber, where they are in power, they haven't lifted the public sector pay cap. Yeah. Richard Lockhead to be followed by Elizabeth. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for a transformational budget which, which is extraordinary given the financial constraints imposed by a Conservative UK government who would rather blow a billion pounds bribing the DUP or spend tens of billions of pounds exiting the EU rather than support Scotland's public services. Yeah. 
And can he confirm there is now no reason for the right-wing Conservative-led Murray Council for proposing cuts in support for vulnerable children and their schools, given today's announcements? Yeah, yeah. Gabriel, yeah, I, mean, uh, I appreciate the comments from Richard Lockett. And he touched on um, some of the other uh, issues, which, of course, if we got our share uh, of uh, the DUP bung money that uh, was provided to the DUP by the right-wing uh, Tory uh, government, that, that would uh, uh, support us massively uh, in terms uh, of our public services. And, of course, in, in VAT for police and fire, uh, we've given more resources to police and fire. And because of the ability now to reclaim uh, the VAT, uh, they will be uh, better off. But I'm looking forward to the, the back money from the Tory government of some £140 million. So Richard uh, Lockhead is right that uh, in the face uh, of a reduced real terms budget in resource, Brexit uncertainty, uh, we have uh, provided for uh, more support for schools across the country, a fair settlement for local government and targeted support within that through the Attainment Fund and the Pupil Equity Fund, which will address the attainment gap, a key defining mission of this government. Yeah. Liz Smith to be followed by Claire Hockey. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary seems to be indicating that he will be making exemptions for special schools and music schools when it comes to their ability to retain eligibility for charitable relief. Can I ask him what reaction he's had from the Scottish charity regulator about how these exemptions will meet the terms of the current charity law? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I haven't. I've only just delivered uh, the budget. I haven't been looking yet. I haven't, I haven't yet had the chance. I'm busy engaging with the Chamber. I haven't yet uh, engaged with others as to the consequence uh, of the budget. But I'll tell you what I do know. I'll tell you what I do know. Is that is that we set out, Barclay didn't say make a special case for special schools, I have to say, in terms of independent schools, but we, in listening to the sector, uh, see the case mm -hmm. for uh, relief to continue uh, for those special schools uh, and others where that's appropriate. So we've taken the right sensitive decisions in that regard. It will have no negative effect on their charitable status, as I understand it, but what we choose to do, but what we choose to do around uh, non-domestic rates uh, is absolutely fair and consistent. Clear hockey to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you, President Officer. And can I refer members to my register of interest and in that I'm a registered mental health nurse with an honorary contract with Great Glasgow and Clyde NHS. To ask the Cabinet Secretary how much money will be spent on innovation and reform of GP services in primary health, uh, primary health care and whether primary care is receiving an increasing share of NHS frontline investment in this budget. It's approximately £110 million. Pounds. Daniel Johnson to be followed by Tom Arthur. Thank you, uh, £93 million pounds for early years is of course welcome, but is it not correct that this money is ring-fenced to local government and contained in, not on top of, local government lines which his own level two figures show are declining in real terms this year? Surely new nursery places should be in addition to, not instead of, core council services. I, th I, th I would have thought Daniel Johnson would have been happier about the budget settlement. He's mentioned in the past that um, childcare uh, <coughs> and uh, teaching was really important. Um, is some of the resource ring fenced? Yes, it is. And do you know why? It's working. It has employed and allowed local authorities to employ hundreds more teachers in our schools to target the attainment gap. So the formula is working. The resources are working and in schools and education and in childcare too. This is being delivered in partnership with local government. So it's fair to be part of the local government settlement. Tom Arthur to be followed by Donald Cameron. Thank you, President Officer. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary outline what action the Scottish Government is taking to protect a diverse world-leading cultural sector in light of major cuts to UK lottery receipts? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I know that uh, many within the culture sector it may have been worried about the budget, understanding the resource uh, reduction that Scotland faced, and also, of course, that there's a downturn in lottery income as well. And the UK government haven't lifted a finger to support the culture sector in these challenging times. Uh, but that's why the Scottish government, we've not cut their budget, we've actually increased uh, resources towards culture. There are major events in Scotland next year. And we have stepped in to provide an additional £6.6 .6 million for Creative Scotland to ensure that they can maintain support for the regular funding programme despite the cuts from the lottery. 
Donald Cameron to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you. Uh, in relation specifically to funding for the Scottish National Investment Bank, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that he will be using some of the extra £1.1 billion of financial transactions funding from the UK Government to back it? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I will. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the announcement today that the Scottish Police Service and the Scottish Fire Service will be keeping all of the funds that they would have been paying in VAT. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the SNP Government will continue to pursue the UK Government to pay back the £140 million of VAT they have already taken? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, of course we will pursue the UK Government uh, for this sum. Uh, but in this budget, I also propose to increase uh, the police resource budget. We had a manifesto commitment to protect our frontline uh, police budget. We're absolutely doing that and supporting fire service transformation also. So there's extra resources for police and fire. And of course, they'll have the ability to reclaim uh, VAT. And we look forward to the uh, UK government giving us back the £140 million that they've taken from Scotland. Neil Bibby to be followed by Emma Harper. Since 2011, Derek Mackay's own council in Renfrewshire has faced £172 million of cuts. This week it was announced that funding for Families First, a vital support service supporting vulnerable families in Johnston, Fox Bar and Gala Hill, is to be discontinued. You might not be the leader of Renfrewshire Council anymore, Mr Mackay, but these are still your cuts. If local authorities like Renfrewshire are being fairly funded, why on earth is your own SNP Council justified in making these and other cuts? And why have causes call for a truly fair settlement of at least £545 million being completely ignored? Cabinet Secretary. Well, let, let's uh, wait and see what Renfrewshire Council's administration actually has in their budget, rather than the usual scaremongering that they get from the Labour Party uh, every every year. I say to Neil Bibby that the overall local government settlement, the local government settlement it is a fair one. As I've said, it protects local government resources in terms of a resource and provides more on capital. And if they use their council tax powers by up to 3%, it will raise an additional £77 million, putting local government resources into real terms growth. Now, considering the context, in which we are setting this budget. That feels pretty fair to me. Emma Harper to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. The Cabinet Secretary has highlighted that Tories want to cut tax and increase spending. Can the Cabinet Secretary just reiterate for the Chamber how much less we would have for services like the NHS under Ruth Davidson's plans to cut taxes for the richest? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, in understanding the Tories' tax plans better than they do, I now understand that it would mean a £501 million cut from frontline services if we were to follow Tory tax policies. Yeah. Yeah. Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I draw members to uh, my register of interests as a small business hospitality owner? Uh, Scottish, uh, given cu current concerns over forecasted low economic growth in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK, uh, doesn't Derek Mackay think he should be doing more to stimulate business? And the fact that Scottish firms operating uh, from medium size and larger premises already pay more than they would in similar premises in England due to last year's doubling of the large business rate supplement. Why does the Scottish Government continue to punish hardworking employers and family-owned businesses, making Scottish companies less competitive than their UK counterparts. Cabinet Secretary. I'm not sure if Rachel Hamilton has just come into the chamber and missed all my business announcements in the budget, but uh, I think it's important to reflect on what was announced last year and this year. I mean, last year we uh, enhanced the threshold for small business bonus, and now that lifts 100,000 properties out of uh, business rates. Uh, we also ensured that fewer businesses were paying the large business supplement by amending the thresholds there too, and we lowered the poundage last year. This year, the number one ask of businesses was to use CPI, not RPI, for the poundage, and that's exactly uh, what I'm doing, as well as all the other interventions on innovation, on skills, on attracting people to come uh, to Scotland, on the infrastructure investment, on digital. So we are preparing for 
uh, the future to put Scotland ahead of the curve in terms of technological uh, intervention, skills and of course the right environment for businesses to grow and that's why these key business uh, decisions and these key business uh, interventions will matter so much and I look forward to um, the uh, engagement with the business community uh, as to how uh, they support ongoing economic growth. Tavish Scott to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Finance Secretary said it was a budget for all of Scotland. So why didn't he accept his government's crystal clear commitments made not to me or to Liam MacArthur, but to the island's councils to support ferry services within Orkney and Shetland in today's draft budget, given Parliament's vote last week? Cabinet Secretary. Well, actually, the Scottish Government is delivering on our commitments to the Northern Isles, just like all parts of Scotland. One of the key items funded in this budget is delivering the equivalent of road equivalent tariff to the Northern Isles. That was in our manifesto, that was in empowering our island communities' perspectives, and absolutely we are investing that uh, in this budget. The question for, for Tavish Scott uh, and Liam MacArthur will be, are you going to vote against that kind of uh, investment that we're putting into the budget? And specifically in relation to inter-island uh, ferries currently run by the Council, I'll continue to engage uh, with both Council leaders. Both Council leaders told me, though, that the Liberal Democrat constituency members would be coming to see me this week uh, with a proposal uh, to try and put uh, internal ferries funding in the budget. My door was open, but I didn't get the visit from uh, the Northern Isles constituency MSPs. I simply say this, this is, this is a minority government. I will require a uh, consensus to get the budget uh, through. Uh, I said to the Liberal Democrats that if they wanted me to put it in the budget, would they come and engage with me? And if I did put it in the budget, would they vote for it? And I didn't get an answer to that. But look, I'm a fair and reasonable guy. My door, my, my door is still open uh, to engage with other political parties. If you want me to support uh, other items, then by all means engage with me positively and constructively. Bruce Crawford to be followed by Claire Baker. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the fair and reasonable Cabinet Secretary to, to remind me just how much additional money he's putting into city region deals, because you'll know, Cabinet Secretary, it means so much to me representing Stirling. And just for the fun of it, and to wind up the Tories, can you remind me what the percentage of Scottish taxpayers will actually pay less tax as a result of your announcement? Cabinet Secretary. 70% of taxpayers will pay less tax. And on the other point, on city deals, we are doubling the funding to city deals to over £120 million. Pounds. Claire Baker to be followed by John Scott. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, outside the Scottish Parliament this morning, Denise Christie of the FBU said that we risk our lives every day. Fire appliances are sitting idle because staff have been cut. The Fire and Rescue Service are to get a flat budget settlement in real terms in this budget. Firefighters have told me that the VAT recovery is not enough to plug the gap in their service. There is a 5.5 million for transformation, but it's feared this means closure of stations and the loss of frontline firefighters. Can you guarantee that this budget won't mean that? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, the, um, Annabel Ewing, the appropriate minister, will continue to engage with FBU. Uh, in terms of the ongoing transformation of the fire service. But I see the extra money that we are allocating to the fire service as a good thing. Maybe the Labour Party should welcome that extra money. And of course also the extra spending power that comes from the ability to reclaim that VAT that they couldn't do before. So greater spending power and actually more resources. And hopefully we can deliver a, a, a transformation that keeps Scotland safe and of course appropriately supports uh, the firefighters that do a fantastic job. And last but not least, Mr John Scott. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer, and declaring an interest as a farmer, I note in the Level 3 budget in the Rural Economy and Connectivity Chapter that the Payments and Inspections Administration budget has risen from 62 million to 82 million, a rise of 30 per cent. Is this a further cost attributable to the failed CAP payments computer programme or something else? Cabinet Secretary. A final question from John Scott. I think farmers will welcome my budget decisions, which, uh, following on from the Barclay uh, recommendations, the Barclay recommendations were to put agricultural land on the roll. I chose not to do that because there was no intention, of course, 
uh, to tax them. Uh, there's support for our, our farming community. There's support for uh, produce coming from the farms as well. And they will know, of course, their interests are now most threatened by the mishandling of the UK government of Brexit and what may come from those negotiations. So we'll continue to support our farmers and also including the scheme that I've worked with, uh, with Fergus Ewing, that's ensured that extra financial support was able to go uh, to farmers uh, earlier than they would otherwise have received their grant. So that has ensured they got more financial support earlier and I know that that was, wench that was very warmly welcomed by the NFU. Thank you very much. Thank you to all members and the Cabinet Secretary for getting through a lot of questions. And we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.